Hey guys, this video is sponsored by SteelSeries, so make sure to stick around after the end to find out how you can get a discount on your next order. Shadow Warrior 3 is not only one of the best FPS campaigns that's going to come out in 2022, but it's also one of the best FPS campaigns we've had in, I think, recent memory. Listen, I know your experience probably differs than mine, but I am having a blast! It's a sequel to Shadow Warrior 2, which is in turn also a sequel to 2013's Shadow Warrior Reboot. But don't worry if you haven't played either of those other two games, or even the original from way back in 1997, because Shadow Warrior 3 is again taking things in an entirely different direction. Gone are all the weapons, stats, the procedural generation and loot drops, instead what we've got here is a really tight story driven shooter focusing on making the player feel like a wise cracking force of nature. Taking a lot of influence from Doom Eternal. And I don't mean that in a bad way either, it really feels like it's had its own way of reworking these similar features and mechanics to make it feel a bit more unique. I think I just peed a little. Now if you want to buy any of the games in the series, including this one, make sure to use my GOG affiliate link. In fact, there might even be a discount there on top of its original price. There's never a bad time to get some wang, and I guess speaking of, let's get into it and check this thing out. I'm in, you son of a bitch. Now, I'll admit that I'm a little bit foggy when it comes to my knowledge of what's happening in this universe anymore. You're just too old to get it. Even though I've played both of the previous games, they may as well have been entirely different franchises because I can remember bugger all connecting them together outside of some of these key characters. Anyway, as far as I can tell, Shadow Warrior 3 starts off at some point in the future after some kind of apocalyptic event or something, with Lo Wang being one of the few remaining humans as this giant world-eating dragon flies around the remains of the now desolated planet. If you can remember back to the ending for the second game, well, then this all might seem a bit familiar, but whether or not that's supposed to be the same dragon, I've got no idea. And Wang looks completely different to how we did in the second game anyway, so your guess is as good as mine. What else do you want from me, huh? What do you want? Either way, during a really cool prologue where you're running on the back of this dragon in the midst of a thunderstorm, it's then shown that Wang screwed up his one chance to stop it, and now he kind of blames himself on the outcome. Seemingly giving up on life along with basic personal hygiene, he now lives in the remnants of the Wang Cave, until old mate Zilla shows up to get his help one last time in a final attempt to stop this dragon once and for all. What else do you have to lose? Their plan is to use the Mask of Hoji, Wang's deceased demon buddy from the first game, as some kind of power source or something, and their first stop is to find a witch named Matoko who can pull some kind of ritual off. You destroyed my son for 3,000 years old. It would help countless invasions and attacks. Well, thank you, thank you, but I can't take all the credit. This time, Zilla's being voiced by Sung Wan Cho, and if you don't know who this guy is, well, then your YouTube recommended feed definitely does. I've had this guy's video suggested to me for like a year now, and it's actually kind of surreal finally hearing him in something I'm actually playing. But the biggest change is that Flying Wild Hog also replaced the original Lo Wang voice actor from the previous two games with someone entirely new. Now, I don't know what the reason was behind that, and I don't really want to poke that beehive anyway, because I'm kind of worried that it might have a hashtag attached to it. But I gotta be honest, if someone hadn't have told me that it was a new voice actor, I don't think I would have even noticed. All the demons are dead, and the gates are still standing. I'll be honest, right? I found the writing in the last couple of games before this just to be really cringe. Are you serious? And it was really over relying on things like toilet humor and dick jokes. That's deeply stupid. So I didn't really go into this with the highest expectations. Now I know that my writing and my jokes aren't exactly the pinnacle of highbrow comedy, and I'm still the kind of guy who thinks that putting fart sound effects into my videos is funny. It is, by the way. Yeah. But some of the jokes in the previous games were just bad. Mm, I very much doubt that. Thankfully though, that really seems like it's been toned down here. And let me tell you, that's a good change. You are welcome. It's like running into an old mate that you went to high school with, and then finding that he's finally grown out of shotgunning beers until he blacks out. <laughs> Bruh. And what also kind of shocked me more than that is that Lo Wang isn't anywhere near as obnoxious as I thought he was going to be. And his new voice actor, Mike Mo, seems to really fit into the character. What the fuck? Did she just summon a trash panda? Hey, hey! What? Come back here, you little shit! He still talks a lot of shit during cinematics, and he almost never shuts up during gameplay, pretty much what you'd expect for a guy that's basically a dollar store Deadpool. Feel free to jump in and help anytime! But there are still some pretty funny moments in the game, which actually caught me off guard. Wang, 
Stop this tomfoolery. This might be our only hope to defeat the dragon. That furry little ball sack stole my mask. What if it loses it? What if it eats it? You can't trust that rat. Also to this cast of side characters are all really likable. It's kind of cool to see Zilla brought back and not just as a one-sided villain. He's come a long way since he first sent his regards to Lo Wang in the form of an angry ninja in a pixelated dojo. Zilla sends his regards to Wang. It's almost kind of got this weird Guardians of the Galaxy vibe to it, with this ragtag group of people coming together in a last ditch effort to save the world. I mean, they've even got their own raccoon and everything. At this point, I've pretty much given up expecting there to be anything linking this to the original games outside of the characters like Wang and Zilla. But I mean, if this is the direction they're going to take the series from this point, well, it could be worse. You are welcome. Plus, you can't deny that this thing differentiates itself from the past two That's entries to the yeah, point yeah. that it really does look like an entirely different franchise. There's some dope music here and there too, and the size of the environments is humongous, giving the whole thing a great sense of scale, so it really seems to set itself apart from those two other games. How is any of this my fault? But it's really the gameplay that matters the most, right? The story doesn't mean jack shit if the combat ain't there to back it up. Now, I really just felt like Shadow Warrior 2 was a bit of an unbalanced disaster. It focused way too much on RNG and had a heavy emphasis on things like gear and upgrades. It was more just about having the right gear for the right situation, dealing with this abundance of enemies who all had different elemental weaknesses and resistances. Not to mention you could pretty much get through 90% of the game by just spamming that one stab and attack. Plus, it also had this open map design that just made everything feel so unfocused and these side missions that just went on forever. Just kind of made me realize that open world shooters are a bit of a hard formula to master and flying wild hogs sure didn't master shit. <laughs> Thankfully, this time that's not the case and all that garbage has been done away with. Thank fucking God. Shadow Warrior 3 is a much tighter and more refined shooting experience. The arenas are much more smaller and they really feel handcrafted. And more importantly, enemy spawns don't feel completely random, or as if they've just been left up to some kind of invisible number cruncher. Arenas allow for lots of movement and mobility, and some of them have these dangerous traps that the player can use to their advantage. Gotcha, bitch. You know, you just get a sense of these areas being designed, you know what I mean? Like actual levels should be. They're proper levels, not just giant maps with an enemy randomizer. I reckon you can usually tell whether or not you're gonna like a shooter within like the first five or so minutes of playing it. I feel like you know right off the bat through the way the movement and the shooting feels. And I just wish I had some kind of camera filming me when I first started playing this because I just had the biggest shit eating grin across my face pretty much the entire time. And the reason for that is that because when Shadow Warrior 3 starts to click, it's an absolute blast to play, no pun intended. I mean, it's not perfect and there's still a few glitches here and there, but this is just so much better than the combat in the second game. It really is night and day, or yin and yang if you want to get specific. Now, without a doubt, the biggest comparison to make here is with Doom Eternal, and Shadow Warrior 3 is also a shooter that emphasizes fast movement and mobility, making use of grappling, double jumping and dashing, and really requiring weapon swapping and precise aim to get through the whole thing unscathed. You can slide, you can chi blast enemies off ledges or into walls of spikes. There's elemental barrels lying around the environment that are just begging to be put to good use. Sometimes the enemies are even nice enough to carry these things on their backs. It's just one of those games that gives you the keys to the toy box and then lets you choose what toys you want to play with. And the other thing though is that you don't have to play the game like that at all. If you want to take your time and sit on a single weapon through an entire combat arena, well, then that's perfectly fine. But I think the people who are into these kind of fast-paced frenetic shooters are really going to have a lot of fun here. It actually kind of starts to make sense now why there's no co-op mode in this one. In the same way, there was no co-op in Doom Eternal. I mean, why would you want to share all of this fun with someone else if you can be selfish and have the whole thing to yourself? I mean, some things are worth sharing with others, right? Things like foosball tables in the Eiffel Tower High Five. But combat in a game like this was designed for the greedy. Now, although the game doesn't specifically mention it, you've got an enemy hierarchy here pretty much similar to Doom Eternal's. In the way that you've got the smaller, weaker enemies who are basically the same as the fodder demons, then you've got the bigger, tougher enemies who are the same as your heavy demon. And these are the ones you want to watch out for, because these are the guys that are going to mess you up if you don't deal with them quickly. Like Doom Eternal, you're also kind of responsible for your resources to an extent, primarily health and ammo, though instead of using a chainsaw or glory killing, this time it's a little bit different. It's actually pretty easy to explain. You slash enemies with the katana to get ammo back, and then you shoot them to get health back. I mean, simple. 
at any time by pressing the right mouse button, you can swap out to the katana instantly. And then if you want to swap back to a weapon, you just press the left one. Again, simple. These weaker enemies spawn in pretty much constantly, so you kind of want to leave them be in case you need some more health or ammo, while you focus on the tougher one, which, yeah, kind of sounds familiar, doesn't it? Aside from that, there's also respawning health and ammo pickups all around the arenas, which I think actually might be put there just to encourage you to be a bit more mobile. Plus that visual of killing an enemy and then seeing all of these power-ups come spewing out of their body is also a pretty similar sight for anyone who's played Doom Eternal. And I gotta say that if you're the kind of person who hated that system in that game, well, I don't think it's gonna really win you over here either. Even though I gotta say that I never really understood that complaint. It's like, oh no, the game's letting me choose when I can get back health, ammo, or armor at my own discretion. As opposed to me having to stop engaging in combat and run away somewhere to grab a pickup. May God have mercy on us all. Yeah, what a fucking bummer. You are welcome. I mean, sorry, I'm bashing on Doom Eternal haters, but I just can't help it sometimes. Ah, come on! Are you guys even trying anymore? About the only difference this time is that you don't have to worry about your armor. I guess Wang's too much of a badass to wear any, so it's just managing health and ammo. Now, if you've been paying attention to any of the pre-release trailers and the gameplay footage, well, then you're probably going to know that there's also a grappling hook, which kind of something that almost seems like it's mandatory inclusion now for games these days. In fact, there's even like a funny little meta joke in there where Lo Wang addresses this. Everybody has one now, man. It's almost like mandatory. And aside from just being used for the vast, vast amount of platforming, it also has some pretty cool uses during combat. In certain arenas, there's grapple points in the air which can be used to quickly traverse the area. You don't get that kind of freedom of movement you got with the meat hook in Doom, but still pretty awesome for getting out of a corner that you'd otherwise have eaten shit in. Plus, it's not just limited to a single weapon. You get to press that E button at any time and then off you go. Yeah, look at you. You can also grapple right up close into enemies for an easy kill, which is again something that can be really helpful during combat. Hey baby, why don't you slip into something more comfortable? Like a coma! It mostly plays a role during platforming though, and Shadow Warrior 3 is just chock full of these kind of sequences, where you're wall running, climbing up ledges and double jumping over these insane drops. I mean, it really should be nail-biting, butthole-clenching stuff, but because the controls are pretty much perfect, it was just never an issue. Somehow, while running across a pit of spikes as the environment crumbles around you is actually pretty relaxing, often coming in between those more intense combat arenas. I actually found them kind of calming, do you know what I mean? Like, it was just nice to run through this gorgeous backdrop, getting to listen to a bit of exposition and reconnect with my physical form. I mean, I definitely had a couple of times when it wouldn't grab onto a ledge properly, or I didn't connect on a wall or something, but I think I could count the instances that this happened on one hand. Damn it! Shadow Warrior 3 really feels like it's got a weapon lineup that's gone for quality over quantity, and they've chosen to go for only six weapons this time, but that's six effective functional weapons. First off, as you'd expect, you've got Wang's Katana. That's a personal weapon. Sword. That's a personal weapon. And thankfully this time, melee isn't the be-all and end-all to combat. Yeah, you can actually play through this thing now effectively with the other weapons. On that front, you've got the revolver, the right gun, and dual SMGs, which look so much like the ones out of Serious Sam 2 that I have to think that they've been influenced by it. In fact, while we're on the subject of Serious Sam 2, can we also talk about these kamikaze enemies who run around screaming before blowing up? Ah, come on! Are you guys even trying anymore? And the whole Asian aesthetic thing, combined with enemies that look like they've been kidnapped out of a circus tent, is right up Serious Sam 2's alley. Anyway, after the submachine guns, you get a grenade launcher, which is more or less like a rocket launcher, just with a bit of projectile drop off. Then you've got like a high powered railgun weapon called the Basilisk. And then finally, the Shuriken launcher. I love the Shuriken. I love the Shuriken! Yes, in pieces. Now the revolver is, well, just a revolver. You shoot this thing six times before reloading and that's about it. But the right gun, aptly named as a bit of a nod towards OG Shadow Warrior fans, once fully upgraded can be fired full auto without reloading, which is really just the same as the full auto mode for the shotgun in Doom Eternal. And I'm pretty sure that somewhere right now under the mayo is just cream in his pants. Next. 
Those last couple of weapons you get kind of function like the rocket launcher and the ballista in Doom. I mean, here it's called a basilisk, but it's essentially the same thing. Firing out a really powerful projectile that just does really high damage. And you can kind of swap back and forth between the grenade launcher and the basilisk in between shots to maximize your damage output. You know, pretty much like the old ballista rocket launcher combo in Doom. They've really limited the ammo capacity for both of these guns, so you can't just spam them indefinitely. I think the limit for both of these is like 5 or 6 rounds, so you're going to have to use something else at some point. Or again, just make use of the mechanics for getting your ammo back. And that's really, I think, the great thing about this game is that none of the weapons or abilities ever feel like they're redundant. Even the Chi Blast, which is something that I just never really found myself using in Shadow Warrior 2, I found myself constantly using this now during combat. That's the old Jedi Force push that knocks enemies back, and there's an enemy here that you have to outright use it against. Because using the Chi Blast against this guy makes him expose his weak spot, which happens to be his glowing butthole, allowing you to finally finish him off. I guess the downside is that there's no alternate fire modes for any of these weapons. There's not mods or anything like that you can swap out to with the press of a button. All of the weapons seem to work the same against all of the enemies. I mean, they're all going to feel the effects of catching a grenade or a basilisk ground to the face, or, you know, eating riot gun shells at point blank range. But it's the weapon upgrades that make the combat a bit more fun here and start to shake things up a bit. You're getting these upgrade points constantly throughout the levels or just by completing optional challenges. I mentioned before how you can turn the right gun into a fully auto, never needing to be reloaded beast, and I think this one is pretty much mandatory. I dare say if you don't beeline towards this upgrade, well, you're playing the game wrong. But you can also upgrade the basilisk, so after hitting someone, it'll freeze nearby enemies. The pistol can be upgraded to cause explosive damage with headshots, and the submachine guns to cause electrical damage when overfiring. You can unlock a heavy attack for the katana, but even better than that, the ability to do frost, lightning, or fire attacks by holding down a directional key and then the right mouse button. These are actually pretty badass, and being able to seamlessly swap back to firearms with the left mouse button opens up some pretty cool possibilities with the combos. I mean, they're not huge changes to the weapons, but they do help to mix the combat up a bit, so it doesn't just feel like you're using the same weapons in the exact same ways from start to finish. I'd say that probably about halfway through the campaign, I had all the weapon upgrades that I wanted. And then from that point on, I just kind of blazed through the rest of the levels, fully immersed in low wank's fun zone. With a ninja wing, a ninja, a hero, a warrior with a killer six pack and an ass you could bounce quarters on. Probably the biggest similarity to Doom Eternal though are all these executions, what the game calls finishes. And this is probably one of the coolest new mechanics. Because while it's really easy to just shrug these off as being glory kills, which I'm sure so many people are going to do, that's really not quite the case. Because instead of just giving back health points, they also have various effects depending on what kind of enemy you use it on. For the basic enemies, you might just get a bit of a health boost or rip out the frozen brain of another enemy and then you can use it as a frost grenade. Nice to see you. But with these bigger enemies, it gives you limited access to their unique weapons, called gore weapons, some of which are insanely fun, not to mention effective to use. One of the earliest ones you'll get is off these big minotaur looking guys. By first punching the dude's arm off and then ripping his hammer hand right out of its socket and then swinging the thing around like it's an elephant's dick for the next 20 or so seconds. Another one comes from these samurai looking dudes, and with this one you steal their sword and then can start flying around killing other enemies in a couple of hits. Which I do also kind of think reminds me a lot of the Crucible from Doom Eternal. In peace, brother. There's like a Mancubus enemy you fight later in the campaign, I mean it kind of looks like a combination of a Mancubus and Quado from Total Recall, and you just outright rip his guns off his arms and then put them right to use. Somebody got rolled hard and put away weapons. I don't even know how to describe some of these either. I guess one of them's kind of like the Yucca Arrow from Guardians of the Galaxy. It's a homing eyeball that flies around the area doing damage to nearby enemies. I guess the enemies didn't see that coming, did they? Like this one's like a goddamn fireworks crank gun. You pull out of those weird xylophone looking enemies. I don't know who comes up with this stuff, but I never knew how much fun a fireworks gun could be until I started playing this game. And I knew that every time I saw one of these assholes hopping around that it was gonna shoot me some goddamn fireworks. In terms of how this works with the combat, it's actually been integrated pretty well. Because although you might want to use these as often as you can, it actually takes a fair bit of time to charge your meter fully up. It's a bit like the chainsaw fuel gauges in Doom Eternal, where the bigger enemies often need a few more charges to use, the big enemies needing maybe two or three, while those smaller guys need only a single one. 
so you really want to try to use it at the right time and with the right enemy. Some of the arenas go on for a good 5 or so minutes without any checkpoints, so these can almost be a get out of jail free card, giving you a much needed health boost, but also a powerful weapon to help level the playing field. It is a visual spectacle, but it's also got the ability to turn the tide of a fight entirely in the player's direction, so there's a fair bit of strategy to it. Arenas often feel like one-on-one -on -one deathmatch maps, and when you've got half a dozen enemies packed into these, things can start getting pretty damn intense. So turning into the nothing personal meme at just the right time, well, it's a hell of a feeling. I think my favorite arenas are the ones that contain those environmental traps. You know, the giant spinning blades and spiked wrecking balls, all activated by shooting these glowing buttons. And about the only thing that I don't like here is that there's not more of them. Speaking of not liking things, that kind of brings me on to my main issues with the game, and there's two major problems that I have with the Shadow Warrior 3. The first being that the game is just really short. I finished the campaign for the first time in around 5 or so hours, which is pretty short when you consider how long the previous game was. What's also kind of lame off the back of that is that there's no kind of new game plus mode, or even the option to go back and replay the levels, collecting things you might have missed, or trying to complete all the weapon challenges and earn all these upgrades. I mean, just give us the option to replay the levels with all of our gear and upgrades unlocked. I mean, this really isn't a weird request. In fact, it actually not being in the game is really weird, especially for something coming out in 2022. After I did a second playthrough, I was around the 8 hour mark or so in total, and I had all but only one achievement left to get. So yeah, not the longest game in the world, but in its defense, they're not really charging full price for it. Damn right. The second thing is that the game is also just way too easy, man. I played through it on hard mode for my first playthrough, and aside from a couple of areas here and there, I pretty much breezed through the entire thing. I mean, I died a couple of times to the boss fights, you know, until I got the hang of their movements and learned how to avoid them, but everything else was just a piece of piss. A piece of piss. <laughs> If you utilize weapon swapping and stay mobile, you really shouldn't have an issue with any of the arenas. And I mean, people who are good at something like Doom Eternal, I think are gonna find no challenge here whatsoever. Now, I don't know if they've done this to make it more accessible to people playing on the consoles or something, or so they don't ostracize some of the more, shall we say, delicate gaming journalists, but it's definitely not as crushing as I really would have liked it to have been. There's some levels where you spend maybe half the time doing nothing but platforming. In fact, one of the last levels is literally just that, running on walls and listening to exposition the entire time. And most of these are really hard to fail, unless you have like a sneezing fit or something, or someone happens to pluck out both of your eyeballs. So I really kind of feel like they need to add in some kind of hardcore mode, because right now they've just got easy, medium, and hard, and hard really ain't true to its namesake. I know that complaining about a game not kicking your ass is a weird thing to do, but it just kind of feels like hard mode is too forgiving. And people after a truly hardcore, ultra nightmare, come get some wank kind of experience, well, they won't find that here. Sorry. I think another thing too is that people are really going to be comparing this thing to Shadow Warrior 2, which is fine, but both games have so little in common now, and people coming into this off the back of that expecting more of the same are in for a harsh wake-up call. Honestly, I have no issue with this because I really thought the last game was a fucking mess. Just of all these different mechanics, like trying to jam a square peg into a round hole kind of affair. I guess my point is that just because you're a fan of Shadow Warrior 2, that doesn't mean you're going to be a fan of Shadow Warrior 3. <laughs> But for me, I think this is not only the best game out of all these three recent ones, but also the best game that Flying Wild Hog have ever made. I just kind of wish it went for a little bit longer. And all I wanted to do as soon as I finished that campaign was start again and keep playing. I hope they can bring out more levels or content in the future with some DLC, because they've really managed to create a really fun and addictive gameplay loop with this third entry. That'll do, Flying Wild Hog. That'll do. You are welcome. Right, so if you're still watching, well, thanks for sticking around. And let me give a final shout out to my sponsor, SteelSeries. SteelSeries makes some of the best gaming peripherals from headsets, keyboards, mice, and gaming pads, all synced together with a handy program that lets you modify the hell out of them. I'm a bit of a stickler for high quality mouses and keyboards, and whether you're playing a game that's eight months old or eight years old, it makes a huge difference in how well something handles. I would never recommend something that I don't use myself, and I'm pretty stoked to be able to offer a discount to people looking at buying some new gear. So just make sure to use that Chad promo code GMAN at checkout to get 12% off your next order. And as always, thanks for watching.